uh, for folks that just joined, thank you. I'm in my, uh, Seattle this week for Microsoft Ignite, and everything's about AI and Copilot. But, but like how you describe it, Jan, it could be sometimes overwhelming. Number one, it's overwhelming for a lot of customers out there, and frankly, for some partners and MSPs as well. So as Jan had mentioned, let's take a very logical fro- approach. The first step is certainly you know your customers better, where they are in their journey, and it's important for you to educate yourself. I'm not talking about you have to start building products or or fancy and complex AI uh, capabilities, but think about the benefits that AI uh, provides from a day-to-day productivity. And certainly this is where you can help your customers in the uh, Microsoft 365 space, Google Workspace, um, because these hyperscalers, these cloud providers are now introducing AI functionality such as Copilot for Microsoft. Right, now, right. Specific to Copilot, they just released it. So the good news is it's so new, number one, that it's not like everybody jumped onto it already. It, we're still at the learning phase. And number two, for 365 Copilot, it's $30 a user a month. So the price may, you know, from the I- I- initial price tag, maybe sticker shock, but it, it's certainly very powerful. And, and then the value is there. So, so that's one of the early things that, especially if you're servicing your customers around Microsoft, is you really have to understand the value of Copilot because if the customer has to pay another $30 per user per month, it has to be a strong case. It plus services you want to build around that, which I'll, I'll talk more about in a second. Right. And I think, you know, you're making a great point. It's one I, I make a lot is I think, you know, you can't consider it a real AI revolution unless tech giants like Microsoft and Google are involved, right? Um, and the interesting thing about some of this artificial intelligence is a lot of this tech has been around for a while. Like if you think of the suggested responses in Gmail or Outlook, they're technically artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they're really advancing their technology. So to your point, it's just an easier sell, okay, the sticker shock may be a little bit there, but when you think about a company, for example, for Microsoft Copilot, think about a company you have, and most companies these days are, becoming more and more tech uh, oriented, right? The companies run on tech, right? Doesn't matter what kind of industry you're in, every company is a tech company now. And if you think about their, you know, like Copilot's ability to enhance developer productivity, speed up development, code consistency, compliance, all of a sudden the price doesn't seem that high. And the same with Google. If you're listening and you're thinking, hey, I'm not a Microsoft, you know, my clients are Google workspace um, folks. Well, Google's workspace, um, their AI duet, like has smart reply and smart compose. It has data analysis and insights and collaboration capabilities. So adding those on based on the environment your client is in, I think is masterful. And then, for example, if you're a collaboration partner, I just at Cisco's event last week, um, what they've done to WebEx, you know, with AI is is frankly, you know, just astonishing and just super fun um, because some of the stuff they've done and, and that I loved was an example of, you know, real life, you're on 20 calls back to back to back to back to back every day, right? Um, they're now all of the collab providers, Microsoft, WebEx, um, and, and some of the smaller ones too, but I'll use those too. And since Microsoft and Cisco now have a partnership, I think it's a great example. Um, if you walk away from your WebEx meeting to answer the door, because there's, you know, the plumber has finally showed up, you walk back five minutes later, it's now summarizing, it knows you left, the camera saw you left, knows you came back, and it's summarizing what happened in the meeting while you were gone. Mm. You don't miss anything, right? And these are examples of where we can say, hey, an MSP has to build an MSP practice. But these are simple examples, right? Where products that you already sell are starting to have upgraded modules or upgraded features that will get customers to start to um, adopt and adapt yep. their practices for AI. And I think that's where it starts, right? Yep. It starts with just, you know, kind of, looking and and saying, look, if I understand AI, I understand some of the basic business, right? To understand not just the technology, but also how it impacts That's the right. business. Then you can identify the right AI solutions. And then once you do that, you can really look at the next steps, which are things like yep. developing your internal AI expertise and skills. But again, I think, you know, you eat an elephant or a whale one bite at a time. 
That's right. So this kind of this one size fit all gen AI feeding frenzy that we're on um, is not necessary for most MSPs. For most MSPs, it's to fit, pick some adjacent technologies to what you already provide to your customers and, and really beef up your yeah. offer there first. So, so in my mind, the, you know, I, I want to make it practical, right? So what's the first thing you can offer? Today, right away, what you can offer is things like education, workshops, yeah. uh, ready, readiness assessments, and the playbook is out there. So if you just, let, let's pick Microsoft. If you search Microsoft Partner AI Playbook or Copilot Playbook, they give you step-by-step step and even the, 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 the PowerPoint presentations on briefing your customer about this. So that's the first step. Now, some of this may not be paid. You spend an hour, two hours, but it's important to educate your customers. Right. And in addition, Microsoft has a whole directory of AI partners. And uh, I've seen a lot of partners already offering readiness workshops or AI assessment. So these are table stakes that you could do today because, boy, I'm, I, I, I got to tell you, everybody's excited. Everybody's hungry. But a lot of customers just don't know where to start or what's the value to them. So, yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, educating your customers about generative AI specifically because it's so hot, right? Um, it's growing in relevance. Its impact is coming. You're hearing big companies say, hey, we're going to be able to cut 30 percent of our resources. Um, I always make this statement. I borrowed it from our, our uh, head of research, Dr. Ashlyn Silva. She made the statement in a keynote um, uh, last month that uh, AI will not replace you. Someone using AI will replace you. Mm. Uh, and I said, that is exactly, right? That is exactly the position. So it's not as if AI is going to replace MSP, is going to replace a million workers, you know, except for truly automated tasks. It's really about what is it going to do? And so, mm. You know, I think that this concept of educating your customers and first starting with identifying what their baseline knowledge is, because a lot of people have heard the boogeyman story around Gen AI, right? It's going to replace us all. The robots are coming, you know, Starnet, uh, you know, uh, Terminator level. Skynet, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Skynet is coming. Um, and then, then you can decide, like, where do you structure your learning path, right? Does it start with the basics of Gen AI and its applications and gradually move towards more complex concepts and industry-specific use cases? Um, or are most of your customers already having these conversations? And then, you know, I think you can use, to your point, these um, uh, online um, uh, guides from Microsoft and others in the industry. You've got websites like Coursera and Udemy and edX offering courses on AI, right? Um, you've got a ton of white papers, Gartner, McKinsey, Microsoft, Google, they've all issued amazing things. And then for me, um, I like subscribing to a couple of blogs and newsletters. Uh, MIT's technology review is fabulous. So is AI trends um, or the AI section of whatever tech news outlet you like. It, it's really cool. And um, last week I actually subscribed to a couple of YouTube channels and podcasts on AI. Um, and, and I think that's great too. There's LinkedIn groups on AI. There's Reddit communities. You might want to start your own Reddit community on it. Um, and then, you know, if you look at companies like OpenAI, Microsoft, Google AI, and others, to your point, they all have documentation. And the goal is to make that Gen AI understandable, relevant to your customers' needs. But you could even just start simple, pop up a new page on your website, and just aggregate some YouTube channel podcasts, some tech blog and newsletters, some industry pubs and make it a resource guide for your for your, uh, for your customers, right? And that doesn't require you to create any of that content. It merely requires you to aggregate some of it. And so I think that that's a way where we're starting to see partners say, I'm gonna have this conversation. And oh, by the way, as I'm having this conversation, let me provide you with this resource guide that housed on our website, low cost, simple way to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100%. So so that's definitely the first step, right? It's education. I believe next, it is. Yeah. Yes. And then the next step. Now let's let's talk about building a service. And certainly, at the end of the day, we want some type of you know MRR, monthly recurring revenue, uh, value add to our customers. 
what are some examples, Janet, that um, that a lot of our partners, MSPs, can offer? What are those services that can have uh, MRR type of offering? So one thing uh, I can quickly share and provide some idea on is AI relies on a solid data foundation. And once you deploy AI, it doesn't mean that, you know, you just leave it alone because number one, it's going to create a lot more data. Number two, it's going to rely on your data being sound. So for example, if your data is not well classified or tagged and you ask Copilot, what was Janet's bonus last month? And, and, and it sits in some word document there that wasn't properly secured or classified. Potentially, the AI can, can uh, provide the information that you're not supposed to. However, if it's properly tagged and classified and organized, uh, Gen AI would know, right? So point being is, if you want to start offering a recurring type of revenue, a recurring service to your customers, think about uh, a service being able to protect, secure, and optimize their data on an ongoing basis. I love that. Yeah, I love that. And I think that data, and I love that example you gave, because some of the um, popular AI platforms, let's use ChatGPT as an example, you now can upload documents, right? Mm. So I just saw, you know, I just saw people getting 50 page white papers, attaching it to ChatGPT and saying, please summarize this for me and, you know, in bullets. A minute later, right, everything is summarized um, and they don't really think they have to read the paper. And, and I bring this up because I think the client motivation for seeking an MSP out that has AI capabilities is important, right? So is the client motivation competitive advantage, right? They want to help leverage AI to your point about using their data to optimize operations, outdo their competitors, seeing this a lot in retail, right? Retail saying, hey, I want to better understand customer behavior, customer movement mm -hmm. patterns in the store, customer, you know, purchasing, past purchasing, next best purchase. And I want to do it because I want to beat my competitors. And then I have others that are saying, hey, I want improved efficiency. So they're after AI solutions that can automate like mindless and repetitive tasks and optimize resource allocation. And one of the examples last week, somebody was saying that it used to take their finance team of uh, 148 people uh, 38 days to close out the quarter and they were able to cut 35% of their finance team and it takes them 12 days now to close out the quarter using AI solutions. So, you know, there are all these areas where I think once I've started educating my client, my most important question is to say, how are you trying to use it? Are you use, looking for smarter security? So they want to take advantage of AI driven security services like threat detection and vulnerability management. Is it data insights, right? They're trying to identify patterns and receive insights. Is it personalized services? So like they want to use natural language processing and machine learning to personalize their services and make their customers happy. Um, when I start asking those questions about what is the client motivation, it becomes very clear to me that there are kind of two camps. Camp one is improved efficiency. I can't afford how high headcount costs have gotten and I need improved efficiency. Um, and that automating of repetitive tasks is critical. Um, and so they're looking for those, they're looking for that, right? The other camp is in efficiency, competitiveness, um, growth, right? They're not looking at efficiency as a cost cutting exercise. They're looking at it as a growth exercise. And so they're interested in how do we better extend personalized customer experiences? How do we take our data analytics and use an AI algorithm so that we can recognize patterns, so that we can predict things, right? Garnering some meaningful insights from all this massive amount of data um, uh, that they get. And, and in some instances, they're overlapping, right? So the efficiency people and the competitive people are implementing chatbots and virtual assistants and automating reporting, but they, they segue apart from each other in the most important goal is growth or most important goal is cutting costs. Yep. Yep. And a little so, tip, anybody who um, was recently purchased um, or recently took investor money 
Um, I've seen a high positive correlation in those folks wanting to improve efficiencies and cut staff. Um, and those who have not taken uh, investor money, self-funding their growth, et cetera, I'm seeing a high correlation between them focusing on AI that helps them grow. So, so we talked about two things, right? So we talked about number one, education. And number two is really around understanding the motivation, the business use case, why AI, and then start thinking about building a business around that. Uh, for, for colleagues and friends listening in, would love to hear from you all on your perspective around building a practice around AI and what you're hearing from customers. So if you raise your hand, would love for you all to come on stage um, learn what you're hearing, what you're seeing in your part of the world, because I know we've got folks out in EMEA, we've got folks uh, here in the U.S., so would also love to hear from you as well. So uh, if you could raise your hand, we'll bring you up on stage, But uh, uh, and you could do that anytime. So, so Janet, based on that, right, how do you foresee AI shifting the MSP ecosystem? Uh, will, will, will certain parts of what MSP do uh, won't matter anymore, or how do you how do you think about that? And you know, we wrote um, an entire research report on this on our on our website jsgnow.com. Um, you can get um, download that report for free. Um, but what I will say is that there's been a lot of again boogeyman, right? Um, there's been a lot of folks that have said, "Oh, this could eliminate the channel," and you know, rumors of the channel's demise happen every decade or so. Um, to be fair. And uh, I just don't think that, you know, those rumors are in any way, shape or form true. So I want to start with that conversation saying um, every time you turn around, someone um, is talking about the demise of the channel. Right. Um, and uh, and every time it's not true. So, mm. you know, mm -hmm. so I just want to kind of start there and say, just want to make sure everybody understands that first as I start this talk track. Then what our survey really showed, right, is what is the impact of, of generative AI? And I'm going to speak specifically to generative AI because I think it's important, right? Um, you know, maybe you're thinking I could be eliminated. First of all, again, I will unequivocally say it is not going to eliminate the channel. Um, it is transforming the world. But in the channel, we're seeing um, it have some specific positive impacts. So lowering costs to acquire customers is a great mm -hmm. one. piece as an example. Um, a partner who, you know, has closed 20 security deals from 400 leads in the past six months, mm -hmm. as an example, can now use AI to not only mine the data um, regarding leads and closed deals to find the commonalities, but can now also use generative AI solutions to determine the best leads for the future and how to transform their campaigns to appeal to those leads. Um, and so that's not going to replace MSP salespeople, but it'll lower the cost of leads and it'll deliver more closed leads, right? So now, of course, there's, there's risks in this. We see folks trying to reduce their marketing costs in the channel by using, for example, ChatGPT and the content shows it. Um, so what we've seen, though, is for the channel, if they leverage AI for, um, you know, really truly content development, personalized experience, um, chat bots, you know, a, kind of a reduction of what their people have to do and still give a good customer experience. Um, they've had revenue increases of between six to 10%. Um, and consequently, they've had two to three times faster revenue generation than those that don't utilize AI. So it's quicker to come. It's bringing um, some, some time with it. And it's saving marketers in those MSPs about five hours of work weekly. So that's pretty impressive. It's also lowering their support and documentation costs, right? right. Um, AI can process about 20% of customer service requests right now. Mm. Um, foresters opining. So if you think of that, right, instead of the massive, let's use a, an MSP who's doing a documentation for a cloud migration project, um, they can actually have a lot of that documentation now, you know, done by the machines, saving right. their tech all that time. And, you know, finally, we're seeing cost reduction in customization and app development. Um, right. 
And so those folks that are having to put together, you know, some, some really bespoke solutions are, are getting faster. So then what's the impact of the MSPs of those top use cases? Um, we're seeing AI based models provide an increase in that business productivity um, in the next seven to 10 years. We think it could increase productivity by about 40% because it eliminates the things that MSPs do that are repetitive. Right. right? right. And a lot of the support that you have to do with your, of your customers is repetitive. Um, and so if you can get rid of that, it allows you to add new, right, new AI offers to your, um, your outbound offers and actually increase your ability to sell more. Um, and at a little better margin, because if you're also using AI for your pricing, um, margins can be improved by about two to 7% of the folks that we're seeing so far using that AI pricing. Yep. So again, we're seeing only positives for the MSPs. Now, if I had to challenge where the negatives could come, we have some vendors who are talking about, um, not pure replacement of the channel, but could a marketplace do this if it was AI empowered? Mm. And so maybe I wouldn't need the channel to sell this. Um, I will be interested to see how that works, considering that more than 40% of the current marketplace offers are placed by a partner. Uh, not 100% sure that that's a, a, you know, unless you've got a click to play solution. And quite frankly, there's no margin in a lot of those anyway, um, that the MSPs are going to care. And then we've seen some vendors also saying, hey, maybe I don't have to pay the MSP as much because if they automate stuff and they're automating marketing and they're doing this, shouldn't my cost for them um, decline a little bit? Yeah, correct. Try not to laugh at those vendors because they're the same vendors that said things like, I don't want to double comp when I co-sell and all those other stupid, I'm sorry for the bad word, stupid things that vendors say when they want to save money. Um, the smart vendors are saying, hey, so if I look for partners who are using a in their own internal business practice to reduce their cost, they should be better sales and services partners because they'll have capacity to service more customers. That's the smart way to look at it. And that's what I see happening. I see the MSPs being able to do more advanced support, more advanced services, more advanced solutions because they outsource to their generative AI platform of choice, the routine repetitive work. Awesome. Tim, welcome. Um, Feel free to unmute your mic and share your thoughts around how you can grow your business with this new world of AI. Oh. Uh, let's see. Somehow, Tim, you uh, went back to, oh, there you go. Let's do this again. Take two, take two. All right. Yeah, these, a lot, okay. All right, Tim. So you have to unmute your mic. There he is, but his mic is still muted. I know his mic's muted. It should be, it should be on the lower right, where you can unmute. Yeah, on on the. You can do it, Tim. Send a smoke signal. Oh good. Oh good. Oh good. Yeah, because uh, sometimes LinkedIn is a little funky, especially if um you haven't used it before. All right, we'll we'll we'll, we'll keep you here, Tim. Once you're ready to go, I'll just unmute to speak up. Um. And anybody else? Oh, God, I'm to... sorry, you guys. I finally Yay! found it. There you go. You see? <laughs> I was sitting here laughing at myself, like, oh my God, I can't believe I can't unmute. A couple of comments. Um, um, the first one around the, the pricing of Copilot and the current limitations of a 300 uh, user yeah. minimum, those are extremely prohibitive um, costs for a certain segment of our customer base right now, especially given that they really don't even understand the value proposition because they can't even see it yet, right? Yep. Like there yep. may be a lot of early adopters that are, are, are getting their eyes on this, but like even some of the smaller uh, service providers like myself are just like, well, how on earth can we can i even i used to be able to just you know if i wanted to experiment something with microsoft i'd spin it up and this just seems so prohibitive uh, number one uh, i think the second thing is is that i've heard that statement over and over again about a i won't replace jobs people using with AI will, will replace 
people who aren't using it. And I, I the, a lot of the early information coming out, I mean, even to your point, Janet, about the story about a 35% reduction in, in financial staff tells me that people are going to lose their jobs. And that messaging needs to be more about how to manage change as AI gets implemented and identify people at risk and how they're going to move move into new careers because there will be job losses. There yep. will definitely be job losses, repetitive tasks, you know, co content writing. We're seeing a, some low hanging fruit in the marketing world um, and also in code, code development, although there's not enough of those people. So um, I think that might not, but I, I agree with you. And, and you know, my, Microsoft, I'm using an example, right? They publicly stated that they're going to have reductions that are delivered through generative AI um, improvements. So I think us coaching the next generation also on where they should be working and what skills they should be developing um, is critical, Tim. I love you brought that up. So, so Tim, let me comment on your first point. And this is my opinion, again, Disclaimer, what I'm going to say, it's my opinion. It's not any, any any information from Microsoft. So I do agree. So right now, I think it's so new that Microsoft have, have, have put this minimum seats, right? 300 seats. So for those not familiar, if today, if you want to sign up for Microsoft 365 Copilot, you have to purchase minimum 300 user seats at $30 per user per month, which is a lot of money. And, and I think eventually that, limitation will go away if Microsoft truly wants to serve all their customers because how about people that are, you know, or companies that are a 50 people company? That's number one. And second, frankly, not everybody needs co-pilot, right? Depending on your function and your role, at least today, adding, you know, $30 per user per month may not entail every single person in the organization, maybe a couple of people or, or, uh, like Janet was describing, maybe marketers in the organization. So I think long term, I don't know when, but that cap will be um, reduced. But yesterday at, at the, the keynote, when Satya was showing all these capabilities, and I started thinking about, yeah, $30 is a lot of money, but l l let me really quantify that. Like even things around, you know, uh, one of the demos was there's like a 50 page Word document, and through Copilot, it says, hey, take this document and create me a five-slide PowerPoint with all the key points. Now, I'm not saying once it's created and, and you just take the PowerPoint and start using it, but it gave you that first base, that first draft already. It's your smartest um, direct report. As I read somewhere, Copilot will be your smartest direct report. Right? So so there is value, even at $30, like in a month, I spend more than $30 on my Starbucks coffee. And, and <laughs> I would rather use that money to to help me with with uh, productivity from day to day. So, I love that. So I, yeah, and let me just step on top of that and say, yeah. so I, I may have a different opinion on the three hundred seats at thirty dollars a month. So, mm -hmm. if you do the math on that for a year, if you're a partner, it's one hundred eight thousand dollars worth of licenses. And I know for many partners that sounds exceptionally high, but um, if you want to differentiate yourself from other partners who won't make that commitment and take mm -hmm. business in your local market, right? This could be a more efficient marketing campaign than a marketing campaign that you might spend that much for just to try to attract new customers at that MRR. So, you know, I am talking with some MSPs who are saying, yes, it's 300 seats. Yes, it's $30 a month. If I don't sell it, right, which you have to assume you're going to sell it, that's 108000 in cost, right? But I think I can sell it. And so two of my nearest competitors who have been, you know, competing with me on price for services for a while and therefore don't have good margins aren't going to do that. So I can go in and immediately start to take business from mm -hmm. So it is a way to think strategically. I think we have to challenge how we think about everything. That's right. Um, right. And and so it, it's and again, for some, it won't be the right answer. But for others, I'm challenging them to say, are you going to let that be the hurdle to you? Because I'm not sure that's a good hurdle to die on. that mm. Tim, mm -hmm. Yeah, right, I, 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 I agree with what what you're both saying. Um, and I think what we're going through right now is just handling the objection, 
objection management to say, um, well, uh, there's definitely $30 a month value in there for individuals that get up to speed on this fast, especially like things like, uh, you know, developer assistance and and getting code out faster. And the things that you've already mentioned around document analysis and so on. I think it's the it's still that barrier of of, of the minimum three hundred uh, client yeah. license, and yeah. and so our customers are asking, well, what could we just you know fire up uh, Chat GPT and see what it's going to offer us at at twenty bucks a month? And and I'll, I'll just one last comment is that the hundred eight thousand translates to roughly a hundred and. 46,000 Canadian. So uh, I, I'm in Canada. So because of the exchange, I don't know. I like I, yeah. it's, it's even more, it's even, it's more, even more of a cost. Yeah. 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 In, 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 I, I, I want to go back to your play around the messaging around it. I think, I think we're at, a, it's an exciting time. I feel like this is akin to when the cloud was just starting or akin when to when when uh, SharePoint first came out, I don't know. A lot of people weren't born yet when SharePoint came out, but but there's this excitement. But at the same time, there's this um, uncertainty, so to speak. Okay, you know, will will, will it replace jobs or uh, it's it it costs a lot of money. And this is the opportunity I feel like, especially for a lot of us uh, service providers, is providing the education, the examples. Because I I for example I, I saw. Um, uh, a partner and what they what he's been doing he's documenting his ai journey he's just been recording he's like okay i know this is the future i'm learning this i'm gonna start recording this and sharing what i've learned and it was interesting because this was what two three months ago and this is around the microsoft ecosystem his followership just doubled and tripled and it's clear people want to learn in the content that he was producing and providing are not marketing content. You know, obviously you didn't get all these content from Microsoft, but all of, all of those are like perfect world, right? Northwind or, or a, a Contoso type of examples. But uh, this partner is just started sharing knowledge and content and, and growing his base. So even at that, right? So even if you're still not charging for it, you can now still, you, you can start building your, your thought leadership and expertise and, and providing that gap. Um, that that a lot of people are 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 seeing today. I docs. I totally agree. I, I kind of want to end my comments on a positive uh, note. That that's very true. That this is this is like nothing uh, I've ever seen in my career. Going back to when the internet first started firing up, and it's it's like I, I talk about the objections out loud, but. Uh, what we have to advertise is all the positives that are going to come out of this because they yeah. are going to be incredible. And and the ones that are going to be great at this are the ones that are doing just like you mentioned your partner friend doing is is just pu- publishing the experience and and talking to customers about uh, how to go about this. And it will be a bit of experimentation, but the ones that – you know, figure this out earlier, the ones with the advantages. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. We got Andrew. Good morning, Andrew. Hey, Welcome. good morning. And hello from Toronto, Tim. <laughs> wow. We have a good Canadian uh, uh, faction today. I like it. Just sneaking in, sneaking in. Um, so, Ducks, I, I wanted to, to really agree with what you said about that switch from uh, switch to the cloud. Uh, tuning into that keynote yesterday, it made me think of when we started rolling out BPOS back in the day before the switch over to Office B-Pos. 365. Yeah. Right? So what I saw yesterday with that announcement of Copilot, uh, yes, there's the $30 seat for uh, the M365 version, but there was also a lot of talk about rolling out Copilot just kind of across the entire ecosystem. Copilot everywhere. We're going to see it oh, in yeah. Windows. You're going to see it in Edge. Right, um, right. And so what I'm thinking is that for these smaller clients who um, either aren't ready to invest or they don't have that seat count that they need, just getting them up and running it and learning how to use that publicly available version of Copilot that is not trained on your data but is still useful, 
I think that's a good starting point in the meantime. Because I, I agree, Ducks. I do think that they're going to open this up to more licenses in the future, but they're just starting with the let's yep. go higher right now as we roll it out and then we'll scale. Yeah, that, I don't have something to that. I think, um, I, and I want to be careful how I say this, but I'm just going to go for it. I heard a very similar message at Cisco Partner Summit last week that AI is going to be embedded in the full solution. We're hearing very similar things from Amazon, from Google, right? All the big players, the pillar players, as you might, are, are having that same conversation. So, Andrew, I love this concept of, hey, get the customer starting to use something, right? Like publicly available co-pilot. And then you'll you kind of nurture them into the purchase. Mm -hmm. um, Well, one of the one of the uh, that's a very good play, Andrew. So for those not who hasn't seen the keynote, Microsoft announced uh, you could do copilot.microsoft.com and you can start using uh, essentially it's Bing Chat Enterprise and uh, really seeing the benefits of it. And the other thing that Satya talked about, or maybe it was Jared Spitaro, is their vision for copilot. It'll be like um, OS. So it's going to be uh, operating system for the cloud, intelligent operating system that will cut across not just 365, it'll be in Windows, it'll be in Dynamics, it'll be in all the Microsoft uh, technology solutions that it will just be there. It's, a, it's like air or water or electricity that, and it'll be seamlessly integrated in all their um, uh, cloud solutions. All right, Jen, I, I think you're, you're muted. Oops, I am. My bad. Uh, yes. So I agree with you 100%. And I think the next level of that, right, is that then partners who supply solutions are going to start putting that in all of their solutions as well. Right. So That's you're going right. to see this thread that comes through from every ISV, from, you know, from every partnership. And I think that's kind of, you know, really important. And then you're seeing, it's almost like you've got this three-legged stool, right? Where you've got the big, I like to call them pillar players, you know, all big enterprises have, you know, stuff from a couple of them. Um, but, and then you're going to see the partners who are building bespoke solutions. A partner might develop a custom AI solution, let's say for a healthcare client, like, you know, a tool that I just saw a demo from a uh, a healthcare oriented um, uh, partner that was using deep learning to analyze medical imaging and was better at detecting diseases than the doctors were. And I saw another one for a retail client to allow them to forecast sales and optimize inventory based on weather forecasts and all other kinds of stuff. Um, and so we're starting to see these kind of pop up. And then the third leg in that stool is you're seeing actual enterprises like JP Morgan Chase right, just launched COIN, their contract intelligence. So it processes legal documents and extracts all the data points in the clauses for their clients, mm -hmm. right? So you're starting to see Siemens just use, I uh, just launched an AI to monitor the health of their own gas turbines. And now they're going to actually sell that predictive maintenance solution. So I think you're gonna start to see this plethora of solutions come in from all three areas, right? The vendors, the partners, and customers that are that are like real world. And they're mm -hmm. gonna start to illustrate what's really possible in practical, achievable AI implementations. And so if you're not there, back to you know, a redux, back to our early conversation, educating your customers, sharing data with them, talking about it, that's where the channel gets in trouble. Because exactly. if you're not about it and you're not helping them find the right solutions then you're not um uh you're, you're not relevant and when you become irrelevant is when you lose right you lose your business edge so that, that to me there's a whole lot of other points you could make but keeping your relevance with your customers because they're still saying uh you know what let's call them because they're our yeah. partner that's the key right now and, and and again that's the beauty with building your business on the backs of Hyperscalers like my exactly. Microsoft. exactly because as we all know, especially Microsoft, they build the platform. For example, Xbox is a platform. All the games are not built by Microsoft, but there's a thriving ecosystem. No different here, right? Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon will build the AI platform, 
and for partners like us, you can build services on top of it. You can build products on top of it, which is really the exciting part. And like all of you mentioned and you've seen, the opportunities are, are just endless. They're, so, they, are, they are. And don't get overwhelmed by them. Right. Start small. What are your clients using? What are the small add on things that you can uh, sell to them? And then what are the small add on things you can use in your business? Start there. Yeah. So just to, uh, I'm going to bring Andrew back up again, but just to kind of recap before we wrap up here, right? So what can you do to build your AI service? Number one, educate yourself. Start with just go to ignite.microsoft.com. Uh, All the content from this conference, it's free. You're going to learn a lot. You can figure out how you can build your business on top of it. Second is certainly start talking to your customers, right? From a perspective of what they're doing, what their challenges, but also educate them around what's coming and what the opportunities are there uh, for them to help grow their business. And third, start thinking about solutions and services either you can package and offer or provide as a, uh, 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 a monthly recurring service for your customers as well. Andrew, go for it. Oh, uh, ducks. I'm going to add a fourth before we open yeah, up. Yeah, go for it. My fourth thing is use generative AI in your business now. Yes. And, yes. And, you know, buy that license, you know, chat GPT is 20 bucks a month or whatever it is. Start using it to do things like summarize documents, write your marketing, update customer documentation, free up that 10 or 15 or 20 or 30% of your most talented people's time so that they can go and solve what the heck are you going to sell in generative AI? Cause they have free time to do it. All right, Andrew, bring you home. <laughs> Ducks to double down on what you said. All of this stuff is moving really fast. It's all so new. You don't need to be an expert uh, in all of these platforms and all the ISVs that are coming out. Be the guide. Your clients are looking yeah. to you as their go-to partner, go-to person. Be their guide. Give them the context. Help them find the way and learn as you go. Learn with them. Yes. Uh, yeah. The best thing we can do at this point. Andrew, I agree again because you don't want to have them say, oh, I didn't know you did that. Yeah. Those are the worst words you can hear as an MSP in my mind. Yeah. I didn't know you did that, so I bought it from someone else. Andrew, speaking of Toronto, I'm actually going to be there tomorrow at an AI cloud event at the uh, Microsoft facility in downtown. So I'm opening a keynote to talk about AI in the future. All right. Well, I need to get myself down there. <laughs> well, I'll buy you a double-double if I get to see you. All right. Fantastic. So, so with that, uh, Janet, as always, thank you. And uh, hopefully, to all that listen, you found great benefit. We'll summarize this we'll post a blog but as always it, it's always um good talk to jen good to learn from everybody and we'll do it again next month right janet if you're looking for channel use cases you can go to jsgnow.com to our research tab and download the generative ai report our research team did on how the channel is going to use ai awesome and we'll put that in the blog post as well so people Thank can get you. to it. have a wonderful day everybody Bye, guys. Thanks for joining.